Spoiler alert for major elements of both the Honkai Star Rail Penicone arc and Matt Pat's Five Nights at Freddy's lore videos, because apparently casting aside reason is not limited to gambling and everything is in fact meaningless. Enjoy! There's one right here! Oh my god, how do I get in there? Give me in, give me in, let 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 me in. Where am I? I can't see, see anything. Where am I? Who am I? What am I doing? Oh face, buddy. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory! Except this isn't Game Theory, and I'm not MatPat, which most of you seem to know, but apparently Hoyoverse doesn't. This is not the video I planned to release this month, but my scheduled half-hour rant about the evils of the IPC will just have to wait another few weeks. Today, we're talking about how Penicone is basically Five Nights at Freddy's. And if you find yourself laughing at this statement, I would like you to note that I am not laughing at all. If you guys remember back after 2.0, my second video on this channel was about Misha, where I correctly predicted that he was both a synthetic being created by our man the Watchmaker and was himself the current Watchmaker, simply by comparing his storyline with the story of the crying child from Five Nights at Freddy's. And well, uh, now that the hype has died down, I should tell you that I may or may not have been memeing for most of that video. Don't get me wrong, I was still doing my best to tie up the information we had as best we could, and I thought there was a definite possibility of it being on the right track, but if I'm being honest, I was not taking that one very seriously at all. So imagine my shock when we get to 2.2 and... I'm a prophet! 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 I PROPHESY! Besides being wrong about what type of synthetic being Misha was, holy crap, that video was about 80-90% to 90 correct. But you know what's even more crazy? Over the course of the update since since then, I realized that this Misha parallel is only the beginning. Besides Misha, I can point out at least four direct parallels between Star Rail and FNAF characters. There are actual connections between these two stories, and after doing a bit of refreshing my memory on FNAF lore, I'd go as far as saying that the Penicone story is, I kid you not, a reskinned retelling of FNAF lore. Am I aware how insane that statement sounds? Yes. Do I still stand by it? With every fiber of my Kakavasha smitten being. These stories are one and the same, and today I have decided to stop suffering in silence and prove it to you so you can suffer with me. Little reminder before we dive into the insanity, even though we're not memeing anymore, don't take this too seriously. We are, after all, comparing a franchise about a haunted robotic singing bear to a video game about a flying train. It's just for fun. Also, this video showcases my own interpretation of the FNAF timeline in some places, and I am by no means a FNAF lore expert, so I will get things wrong or say things differently than you've heard before. So politely, you are free to critique me, just please don't mangle me. And lastly, because it's the internet and I don't want people to get the wrong idea, no, I am not accusing the Star Rail writers of plagiarism or anything like that. Everything they've done with this story falls well within the reasonable boundaries of writers simply taking inspiration from other writers, not copying it. And I'll have a few more thoughts on that at the end. If you have your own thoughts by then, critiques, insights, counter theories, parallels I missed, manifest please put them in the comments so we can go over them together. Now let's get into the video. So on the off chance, I have people here who don't know the basics of the incredibly overcomplicated FNAF storyline y'all gonna learn today. Let's start basic with the founders of Freddy's Pizzeria. Specifically, let's talk about one exceptionally gifted robotics expert, Henry Emily. Henry was the one who actually built Freddy and the rest of the animatronics and was apparently so good at his work that even before the robots ended up with minds of their own, they were said to have an almost magical quality to them, like he could bring the robots to life just just through sheer ingenuity. And his parallel in Penicone has a similar talent. Someone who helped build a whimsical, wonderful world who also has an affinity for magical machines? Who else could it be besides the watchmaker, Mikhail Char Legwork? Mikhail was not only a mechanic for the Express and one of the founding figures of Penicone, he's also the mastermind behind Clocky and Friends. So both Mikhail and Henry have a lovable crew of OCs to their name. And before you say, Emma, didn't you just say you weren't gonna bring Misha into this? Shush, child, this is Mikhail, not Misha. Misha is 
not the Astral Express trailblazer who founded the dreamscape. That's Mikhail. Misha is his clone. Interestingly, Henry also has a habit of cloning people, just using robotics instead of memoria, and making them of his daughter Charlotte instead of himself. Henry and Mikhail both led their respective whimsical worlds in peace for, well, decades as far as we know, but then things take a turn for the worse because they each have a business partner who makes some, shall we say, questionable decisions. And this is the second character parallel we're gonna look at. Henry's business partner is, of course, the purple guy slash yellow rabbit who always comes back, Mr. William Afton, who's now infamous for committing acts of stabbage against his underage customers and hiding the bodies inside the animatronic entertainment. Yeah, can't imagine how that would cause any issues. Mikhail's problems, however, started when his business partner, Gopher Wood, decided it would be a good idea to use the core of a hecking star to power the dream. Oh my freaking gosh, when will you people learn? Stellarons are a one-way ticket to cosmic problems. So yeah, Mr. Gopher Wood is the man behind the, okay, maybe not the slaughter, but definitely the corporate breakdown. Now, Old Man Wood may not have been killing kids that we know of. Apparently, children aren't allowed in the dreamscape, so I mean, there's gotta be some reason for that. But either way, Mr. Wood was responsible for the dreamscape becoming a death trap to anyone caught in its orbit. But what's interesting is, while the actions that drove a wedge between Afton and Wood and their friends are different, they appear to have similar motives. Afton had a preoccupation with the science, if we can call it science, behind how objects come to be possessed or haunted, because he was trying to find a way to put his son, who accidentally had a Freddy Fazbear-sized bite taken out of his head, back together. Was that the bite of 87? Meanwhile, Gopher Wood, while he is acting in service of Enna the Order the entire time, does seem to want the best for people on some level, with one of the main selling points of the dream being it's a place for the disabled or terminally ill, such as Firefly, to lead a semi-normal life with the time they have left, or even to keep living for a time after their physical body is gone. It sounds like a pretty sweet deal until you learn that leaving? Not an option. Apparently, the disagreement between Mikhail and Gopher Wood was so bad that Mikhail yoked himself into the dreamscape's basement to get away from it. And Henry probably would have done the same with Afton, except Henry got arrested for killing five kids. The kids that Afton actually killed. You are a horrible friend, do you know that? Never have I hated something purple so much. Either way, Mikhail leaves, Henry is made to leave, and that leaves Panacone and the pizzeria in the hands of Gopher and Afton, respectively. And that's when things get really bad. Because now they have no one to keep them in check. They both go full villain mode. Afton starts doing human experiments, some of them on his own kids, to try and figure out what makes ghosts go burr. And Mr. Wood begins to manipulate emotions and erase the memories of some dream chasers to keep them from getting restless and trying to leave. He even goes as far as turning some of them into, well, I won't call them animatronics, but this ain't exactly human, is it? But as they say, you reap what you sow, and in due time, both of them not only face the consequences of their own actions, but end up having to endure the exact same hell that they inflict on others. Afton ends up spring-locked inside one of the very same machines he used to hide his victims, joining them as a mechanical ghost and becoming the rotting yellow rabbit we know as Springtrap. Gopher Wood loses his physical body, forever trapped in the dream with no hope of leaving, and taking the name Dream Master. But see, now we have a problem, because these two monstrous people have now accidentally discovered immortality. And while some people in these stories may be deserving of eternal life, it is not either of them do. Good thing someone else thought so too. Welcome back, Henry and Mikhail. With a little bit of ingenuity and a clever invitation, Mikhail and Henry invite all of the concerned parties, including Springtrap and the Dream Master, to, shall we say, a feast of sorts. For Mikhail, it's the Charmony Festival, and for Henry, it's the newest iteration of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. A big, wonderful celebration with everything the villains want in one place, just long enough to get everyone there. And then the tables turn, and the bright and colorful world that Henry and Mikhail founded is burned to the ground with everyone inside. Unfortunately, neither Henry nor Mikhail live to see their good work, but they accomplished their goals. Springtrap and Dream Master's victims are set free, and the villains in question are no longer able to hurt anyone. And sometimes that's as happy an ending as you can ask for. And do you see what I mean about this being the same story? Legitimately, this is uncanny. The story beats and character arcs are the exact same, and believe it or not, this is only the first parallel. Let's talk about a much shorter and simpler one next, just because my brain is still freaking reeling. Let's talk about Vanny, or Vanessa, or both of them? It's still not clear if Vanny and Vanessa are the names of one person or two in FNAF lore. Arguments can be made that Vanny is just a nickname for Vanessa, that there
there's a multiple personality plot happening, that they're twins, or that one of them is an animatronic clone. All of these have precedent in the FNAF franchise. All of them make sense in some areas and not others. Occam and his razor are just weeping right now. But for this video, we'll go with the theory that they're twins, because the two characters that they mirror most closely on Penacone are also twins. I'm of course talking about Robin and Sunday. Sunday being Danny, Robin being Vanessa. The timeline here is a little bit messier than the first section. In the FNAF universe, the parallel begins years after Henry set fire to the restaurant. A new company acquires the rights to Freddy's and rebrands it into Fazbear Entertainment. And in the process of moving all of the programming for the animatronics over to the new system, they discover that Afton either uploaded his consciousness to a computer or made an AI version of himself to carry on his legacy. I don't know. We don't know. Nothing in this franchise is truly known. Doesn't matter. Either way, he's now locked in a computer system causing all kinds of problems as the pixelated bunny in purple that we call Glitchtrap. Sir, can you please just once do us all a solid and not freaking come back? In Penacone, this parallel begins after Gopher Wood loses his physical and his dreamscape body and is forced to speak and act only through the dream chasers. The FNAF equivalent of that would be sort of like if Afton skipped being Springtrap and went straight to being Glitchtrap, kind of. Either way, the point is, after Afton and Gopher become disembodied spirits, doomed to remain forever trapped in a virtual reality, the two of them, of course, need some way to exert their influence on the world they no longer have access to. So each of them starts training an acolyte of sorts. For Glitchtrap, it's a young IT worker named Vanny. And for the Dream Master, it's his adopted son, Sunday. And the two of them follow their master's orders to the letter. Sunday may be the head of the Oak family, but it's Mr. Wood pulling the strings, bringing Sunday into closer alignment with the order until it nearly consumes him. Meanwhile, Vanny obeys Afton to the point of killing people for him, and there is evidence that she may have even allowed him to sort of program himself into her brain? I don't know, man, this franchise is crazy. Vanny and Sunday both have twin sisters named Vanessa and Robin, and both sets of twins had a not fantastic home life growing up, so as a result, all of them view either Glitchtrap or the Dream Master as a sort of father figure. But while Vanny and Sunday work in tandem with their father figures, Vanessa and Robin couldn't be more opposed to their goals. If you haven't played the games and all you know about Vanessa is the meme? Freddy, you're supposed to be on lockdown. Vanessa? <laughs> then you might not be aware of this because looking at it from the outside, she's kind of painted as the villain. But no. While Vanessa and Robin are not the main actors when it comes to their father figure's final defeat, they're each the person in the story who arguably causes him the most problems, opposing him in small but effective ways and getting a bit of a stab along the way until someone else steps in and deals the final blow. Throughout these two stories, the FNAF twins and the Penacone twins have a yin and yang relationship with each other. They directly oppose each other in some places, but they are still inextricably linked to each other until the very end, when the final conflict drives them apart. Both stories end with Robin and Vanessa alone, but having accomplished what they set out to do. And if I've learned anything from this video, it's that Scott Cawthon isn't big on happy endings, is he? Now it's time to talk about what I think is the coolest parallel, the one that actually got me spinning down this path of FNAF similarities. Internet people, it's time to talk about... <laughs> This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sokoroko. <laughs> I'm so sorry guys, I couldn't resist a good advertisement jump scare. But I seriously have to tell you about these. If you remember in my Dream Joy memoir video, I showed you guys last month's version of these boxes. Well, they sent me more. These are the August boxes, and the one I'm opening right now is from Tokyo Treat, and they send out super fun and exclusive Japanese snack boxes every month. This month's theme is Summer Matsuri Flavor Fest. Natsu Matsuri are Japanese summer festivals, which they tell you all about in their cool little booklet that comes in the box. A lot of these snacks are themed around things you'd naturally eat when it's hot, with things like cool down candy, which somehow actually feels cold when you put it in your mouth, and these kakiguri gummies. Kakiguri is Japanese shaved ice, and so the gummies are made to have an almost shaved ice texture, which you think would feel weird, but it's really good. And they come in ramoon, lemon, and strawberry flavors. I also really enjoyed this ramoon mochi. Believe it or not, I have never had ramoon, but I've now gotten to experience the flavor in several different candies, and they are just fantastic. The Sakurako boxes theme this month is Islands of 
of Okinawa, which is one of the southernmost islands in Japan, so all the snacks from this box are meant to showcase the flavors of Okinawa. A lot of these treats are covered with or infused with brown sugar, which is apparently called kokuto. One of my favorite items was the shikuwasa kokuto, which was basically just like a pat of brown sugar, but it had an almost orangey flavor to it. Apparently the shikuwasa is a citrus fruit from Okinawa, so that makes a lot of sense. And in the booklet with this box, they have an article about Ryukyo kokuto, the person who made these candies. I also noticed a couple different things between the two boxes, which include edamame. Fun fact, when I was first going by MMA on the internet, I mistakenly got called edamame enough times that I jokingly started calling myself the bean queen for a short time. And of course, I've got to talk about the tea. This month's tea is sanpin tea, which we call jasmine, and they include instructions for how to make it iced. And that's my favorite way to have tea. It was so amazing. I sweetened it with a little honey because I like my tea sweet, no matter what kind it is, and put it in my fun little cup with the glass straw. And guys, I know I say it's the best thing or one of my favorite things is a lot, but when I tell you drinking iced and honeyed sanpin tea while serenely watching the newest game theory video or just chilling to an old Technoblade VOD ranks up there with one of the best experiences I've had this year. Call me easy to please, but I need you to know I am not exaggerating and I'm ordering more from Amazon. I'm honestly having a really difficult time figuring out how to narrow down my talking points because I could just go on and on about every item here, but I can't move on without talking about the household item. In the Sukuruko box, they send a household item each month. And as you probably noticed, last month's Neko Tenagui has taken a permanent residence on my desk. This month's household item is the little fish dish I've been using for all the candies. Isn't it so cute? Tokyo Treat and Sukuruko want people to be able to experience Japan from the comfort of their own home, and wow, they're doing such a good job of it. Like seriously, at this point, I should just move to Japan. As I said earlier, these are the August boxes, so if you want to try these items for yourself, hurry and order using the link in the description and use code MMA at checkout. There's one link for Sukuruko and another one for the Tokyo Treat box, and then when next month comes around, there will be a new box with new flavors and treats from a new place in Japan. So hurry and check that out if you'd like, or if there's someone you know who you think would like it. I get a commission from each sale, and you get a taste of Japan. Now let's get back to the video. Let me really quick back up and explain how this video came into being. The fact that I've already made a video comparing a FNAF character to a Penacone character is evidence that my brain was already headed this direction because the stories are pretty similar just on a surface level. Penacone is about people trying to escape a dream, FNAF has several elements of people trying to escape a false reality like in FNAF 4 with the nightmares and in Help Wanted with the crazy VR reveal. We have pretty clear indications that those trapped in Enna's dream eventually do become not animatronics but animatronics animalistic synthetic beings for sure. Just like how the kids trapped at Freddy's are made to possess animatronic suits. We even have a funny storyteller who tries to clue us into the nature of the story we're taking part in by, well, telling us more stories. But to me, none of these things really felt like they warranted any more than a, eh, yeah, that's kind of a cool parallel, or maybe a YouTube short at the very most. That is until this moment. Black Swan is Rosalina is the most glam up Freddy is Michael Afton thing ever. <laughs> See, I would prefer Black Swan is Rosalina is, is like a Charlotte is the puppet. It's a puppet parallel. Oh my goodness, that actually... Wait, that works! That's right. In this crazy world of FNAF Panacone fusion, Black Swan is the puppet, aka Charlie Emily. The first thing you need to understand for that statement to make sense is that Black Swan isn't just a random memo keeper who arbitrarily took an interest in Panacone. We're getting more and more evidence with each update that she is none other than our lovely lady nameless, Rosalina. If you want the evidence for that, you can check out my video, The Missing Nameless. We have gotten more evidence since then, but the evidence in that video has already convinced me. You're free to decide for yourself, but for the sake of this comparison, we are assuming that Rosalina and Black Swan are one and the same. And when you establish that assumption, some really interesting parallels start rising to the surface. Charlie's story begins when she is locked out of the pizzeria one night. At any other restaurant, all she would have had to do is enter through another door, but this is Freddy's, where the only thing more questionable than the safety of the kids is the stench of death wafting off the singing robots. Charlie is found by William Afton, and the purple serial killer does what purple serial killer 
killers do. Rosalina, on the other hand, leaves Peniconi to find more land for the Peniconians to live off of, but when she never returns, is presumed dead. The Peniconi readables say that she, or rather her in-universe cartoon representation, Miss Mirror, is killed by monsters. In both cases, Charlie and Rosalina are killed after leaving the big, beautiful, false world they've been confined to. But instead of truly dying, both of them end up telling death not today. Charlie stays by possessing the security puppet, an animatronic her father made to protect her and the other kids at the restaurant when others started going missing. The puppet has more freedom to move around, and it's incredibly smart compared to the other animatronics, making it a definite threat to any person who would try to harm a child in its presence. Rosalina returns as a memo keeper, taking the name Black Swan. She's now a memetic entity without a physical body, meaning she can hide herself from others at will, move through space without worrying about barriers, and even steal glimpses into the minds of others, allowing her to read memories. Both Charlie and Rosalina return significantly different from what they used to be, but maintain the most important aspects of themselves, which is that they're both protectors of the innocent. They both return to their bright, colorful worlds and do their best to protect the victims trapped there, Charlie defending the animatronics and Black Swan protecting the dream chasers, and doing their best to bring the person who hurt all of them to justice. Fun side note, both of them communicate with the main character through a sort of sticker book, too. In the end, not only do they both play a role in freeing the souls under their care, with a little help from some friends, both of them become something like the guardian spirits of their respective worlds. Evidence of Charlie's presence can be seen as recently as the security breach games, in the ceiling and walls and in the security bots. She's still there, protecting the innocent. And Black Swan is someone that shows up everywhere on Peniconi, and in Dreamflux Reef is even called the true founder. They're both people who could be anywhere, could be everywhere in their world because they're woven into it in a way no one else is, protecting the people no one else seems to notice. But they both seem to pay special attention to one person in particular, the crying child. Yeah, I just straight up lied at the beginning of the video. We're doing this again. I already established Misha as the crying child in my previous video, my main piece of evidence being that he is a child and was crying when we first met him, but I've since learned the parallels go much deeper than that. In FNAF, the crying child is the son of one of the founders of Freddy's, who was fatally injured at his birthday party by one of the animatronics after a cruel prank by his brother goes horribly wrong. Was that the bite of 87? And as we know, Misha calls himself the grandson of one of the founders, if being a Memoria clone can be considered being a grandson. Crying child's spirit went on to possess the same animatronic he was hurt by, the original version of Freddy, often referred to as Golden Freddy because of its yellow color. But the crying child is, well, different from the other animatronics and even the puppet. Unlike the rest of them, he can't actually move the animatronic. He can't lift the arms and legs and walk around. He's just stuck there. In the movie, he's depicted as being able to sort of apparate from place to place, but in the games, he seems more or less trapped in his own mind, in the darkness, unable to even see what's around him. In the same way, after he's made, Misha is trapped in the child's dream, Mikhail's safe little world for him, and apparently stays there for years until the express finally arrives. But neither Misha nor the crying child are truly alone in this place. Both of them appear to have two friends who keep an eye on them in this place. The first one is the puppet for crying child and Black Swan for Misha. It's stated pretty clearly in Misha's character story that one of the people who spends time in the child's dream consistently, even taking part in some of his fun imaginary adventures, is someone he calls the Mirror Lady, which we know from looking at the other Panacone readables and the Dream Joy memoir event is none other than Rosalina. She spends time with him, keeps him company, and looks out for him. And the the puppet does the same for the crying child. In fact, in one of the key endings to his story, the happiest day ending, the puppet actually puts together a birthday for the crying child to make up for his ruined party, allowing his spirit a measure of peace. But his second friend is our last parallel for this video, and the one that feels the most significant to the link between these two stories. Misha and the crying child are both incredibly lonely, even before their deaths, with the people around them either leaving one by one or outright antagonizing them. So they both take solace in fictional imaginary friends, talking to them and going on adventures with them as if they're actual real people. These friends follow them into their inner worlds when they die, and more than that, the connection between the child and their friend actually grows even stronger. Misha and the crying child's imaginary friends are not just someone who keeps them safe and looks out for them, they are an actual part of their psyche, a representation of their identity within their internal world and even in the eyes of the people around them. And you might already know who it is. For Misha, this is none other than Clocky 
And for the crying child, it's Golden Freddy. Clocky is Golden Freddy. Both of them are not only the imaginary friend of a child, but a form the child actually takes. And they also are both kind of psychic. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Who are you gonna call? Psychic friend Flocky! Both of them are the stars of the show, the main characters of the cast, but in the end, they're both just a mask for a child to wear, to give him some level of courage in a world that did its best to reject him, and only saw his value after he was gone. On the surface, Star Rail and Five Nights at Freddy's couldn't be more different. FNAF's story exists as something largely hidden. Our gameplay experience largely consists of check the cameras, listen for the sound cue, wind the music box, check the camera, where'd Chica go? Check the camera, oh gosh, it's Foxy, close the door! The actual story is only ever shown in bits and pieces. Dates and times, newspaper clippings, disjointed descriptions of people rather than actual solid information. The jagged edges of a story. And it's up to the fan base to figure out exactly how those fit together, and to fill in what lies between, which over the years we've done our best to do. With Star Rail, the main story of the game seems pretty much front and center, unobscured. But when you look at the readables, the character descriptions, talk to the NPCs, start connecting the symbolism found in the landmarks and architecture, you start to see the jagged edges of another story, layered just underneath. The main story being just a very thin veil for a much deeper and further reaching story. Sometimes it's entwined with the main plot, sometimes it runs parallel to it. But either way, I can't praise the storytelling of these two games enough. Not only giving us something entertaining, but giving us stories that remind us what good and evil look like, and make us think about what they're worth. Hi guys, thanks for sticking around for yet another video. This one was so much fun to theorize about and I want to reiterate, no, I don't think the writers are truly ripping off FNAF here. There is definitely enough difference in characters and plot lines that the parallels aren't immediately apparent, so just being clear. After going through all of these parallels though, I am 100% certain that at least a couple of the game developers are FNAF fans. There's just no way they're not. Either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to look at the description for the links to the Tokyo Treat and critical boxes, check them out, click around the website, use promo code MMA at checkout to get a discount, and let the company know you heard about it from me. Thank you guys so much for your support. These past few months on YouTube have been absolutely crazy. We hit 7,000 midway through July. 10,000 is like just over the horizon. You guys are amazing. Thank you. I'll see you guys in the next video, which should hopefully be about the IPC and how they don't actually follow Klopoth, unless something more interesting happens between now and then. But no matter how the dominoes fall, I'll see you all soon. Until then, stay safe, stay kind.